Hey folks, today I want to talk about fixing bad habits when it comes to right hand technique. And if you saw my last video about right hand technique, then in theory you should be all set to get started playing the banjo as far as the right hand is concerned. But it's not always that easy. We talked about finger picks and planting on the head of the banjo, as well as the placement of your hand and your wrist, none of which is particularly hard to achieve. The real challenge is maintaining those basic principles of right hand technique while you're learning to play new things on the banjo. And maybe you've experienced this, where you try to play something a little faster or a little louder, or maybe something that's just a little bit more complex. And all of a sudden, it gets a little harder to control everything that's going on with your right hand. And maybe you don't notice that something isn't quite right, or maybe you just don't feel like dealing with it right now. But eventually, those things that aren't quite right become the new normal, otherwise known as a bad habit. But it's not out of nowhere. All of our bad habits were developed while we were there with the banjo in our hands, and we didn't do anything to stop it. But fortunately, if we can develop bad habits, then we can also develop good habits to replace them. So let's go over some of the most common bad habits that I see when it comes to right hand technique and what you can do to fix those bad habits. But first, I should tell you about patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo, because that's where you can find tablature for all of my lessons, as well as bonus practice tips. For instance, a bonus practice tip for this video as well as live streams, all kinds of stuff that you can't find here on YouTube. So you're gonna to wanna to check that out. And it's also just a great way to support the work that I do here. So I really appreciate that. And if you don't mind, do me a favor and subscribe to this channel and like this video. That's another really great way to support the work that I do here. And I appreciate that too. So when it comes to these bad habits, some of them are actually gonna be pretty easy. Just a quick reminder to do this instead of that. But some of these are gonna require that you retrain yourself to play in a different way, and that does take time and it takes patience. When I can, I'm gonna give you some specific techniques to deal with these bad habits. But in general, there's one common solution for all of them. First, you need to understand that you might have a bad habit, and then you need to be willing to not do that thing again. As with a lot of things, it's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. This video will hopefully make you aware of those bad habits, but you need to also notice them as you're playing. And not only that, you need to have the willpower to say, I'm not gonna do that when I play the banjo. And that can be challenging because what you're gonna have to do is choose to do something that doesn't feel totally natural right now. But what we're doing is weighing our short-term comfort against things like technique and speed and volume over the long-term. But luckily, in this case, the long term isn't even that long. It might only take days or weeks to eliminate some of these bad habits as long as you're committed to eliminating them. It really just depends how important making progress is to you. Anyway, let's take a look at some of these bad habits. One of the first bad right hand habits that I see people getting into is either forgetting to plant on the head of the banjo or not being able to stay planted on the head of the banjo. And this is a really bad habit to get into because if you're not planted on the head of the banjo, then there's a really low ceiling in terms of the amount of progress that you're gonna make with things like speed and volume and tone. So you should really prioritize this aspect of right hand technique as absolutely essential. But if you're trying and struggling to stay planted on the head of the banjo, then one thing you can do is try applying a little extra pressure. Obviously we don't wanna apply a lot of force. That's gonna create tension and it doesn't necessarily help our tone any but you do want a little bit of pressure so that there's a little added friction. That way you can actually stay put. And sometimes we really just get ahead of ourselves. If this is early on in the process of playing the banjo for you, then it's possible you just need to try to play really slowly until it's comfortable to stay planted. So whenever you play, just make sure you're paying a lot of attention to what your right hand is doing. And if you find that it's floating away from the head of the banjo, it's possible that you're just trying to play a little faster than you're ready for. Planting on the head of the banjo is a foundational technique. And to build that foundation, you do need to spend a decent amount of time doing simple things with good technique. So that might just mean playing roll patterns or playing something slowly. At some point, that's gonna be the most comfortable way to play and you're not gonna to need to think about it at all. But time has to pass from now until then. So spend that time with your finger planted on the head of the banjo, even if that means you have to play really slowly. And on that subject, I occasionally see people planting in less than ideal locations. That can mean on the bridge or behind the bridge or clinging even to the strings behind the bridge for support. And there are definitely examples of people who do these things and actually sound good, but it's a pretty rare group. And if you do these things, then you're kind of gambling with the idea that you're part of that rare group. If you're planting on the bridge, you're actually reducing the amount of vibration that's traveling from the strings to the head throughout the rest of the banjo. The way the banjo works is that the strings vibrate which travels through the bridge to the rest of the banjo, which causes the air to vibrate in a unique way. That's why the banjo sounds the way that it does. But if you put your finger on the bridge, 
then you're effectively limiting the amount of vibration that travels from the strings to the rest of the banjo. You're just killing tone. And beyond that, planting in any of those other unusual locations is going to make it harder to travel up and down the strings, which is how we get different sounds from the banjo. And that leads me to our next bad habit, which is improper hand placement. And there's a couple different ways to think about this. One is that it's not a great idea to keep your hand placed in one area all the time. It's going to work for one type of playing, but it's not going to work for really any other type of playing. And there really isn't just one location for each type of playing. You want to get comfortable playing across the entire spectrum. But take a look at some of your favorite banjo players and see where they put their hands for certain types of playing, and then emulate that and see if you like the results. Just make sure that you're not staying in one location for all types of playing. Our next bad habit is something that can affect players of all skill levels and it's too much unnecessary movement in either our fingers or our hand. That can manifest as stretching your fingers out too far while you're playing, or it could mean bouncing your hand up and down as you play. Now, there is some leeway with this, and if you watch other players, you'll see that there is a wide spectrum of different styles in terms of the amount of movement that you'll see each person using in their hand. But consider that as you play faster, you're asking your hand to do more work in a shorter period of time. At slower speeds, you can get away with it, but the faster you play, the harder it's going to be to keep up. And when your hands have to work really hard in a short period of time, it's really easy to get a lot of tension in your hands. And the reality is, you're not winding up to hit a baseball when you play a note, and your fingers don't need to gain momentum before they can hit the string with an appropriate force. And that means they can be pretty close to the strings at all times. But then the question is, how close? Well, let's take a look at the right hand of Earl Scruggs. <laughs> If this is an issue for you, then the best thing you can do is play roll patterns really slowly with your fingers really close to the strings. And the harder this is for you, the slower you should go. It's possible that you need to just play one note at a time, making sure that you're not traveling too far to get to or from any note. The more you do this, the more comfortable you're going to be doing it faster and faster until it becomes your good habit. And fixing this problem can also help you with another bad habit, which is uneven volume on different strings and with different fingers. There are definitely times when you want to be able to accent certain notes or certain strings. That's part of what makes Earl Scruggs and J.D. Crow's playing so exciting. But we always want that to be intentional. What I'm talking about is unintentionally playing harder or softer with one finger than the other two. That can sound like this. And to understand this, you're really going to have to listen to yourself. So try playing some basic roll patterns, slowly, and see if you can hear one note ringing a little louder than the others, or maybe one's a lot softer. You could also try recording yourself and listening back. That way you can devote your full attention to listening and analyzing. And then you're going to want to make an adjustment based on those results. So play the same exercise again and record yourself and try to compensate for whatever the issue was. Then listen back to that recording and see if the adjustment had the intended effect. Maybe you need to compensate a little more or a little less. It can take a while to get comfortable with what you think is even volume across the strings. And now we have to talk about what is probably the most pervasive bad habit among banjo players, and that's excessive tension. This can affect any part of your body, but for right now, we'll just address the right hand. I'll be honest, this is something that I have to work on every single day, and I might not necessarily be the best resource on solutions for this problem, but I can tell you my experience and what's worked for me, and hopefully that'll work for you. When I'm not holding the banjo, there's little to no tension in my right hand. But when I pick up the banjo and start playing, it's only a matter of time before tension creeps in and I'm muscling through the notes. Most of the time it happens when I'm trying to play a little faster or a little louder or maybe something a little more difficult. But whenever it happens, it's out of negligence. Because if I have it in my mind to not play with tension and I've practiced playing without tension, then I can pretty reliably play without tension. But it's not always in my mind. Maybe I have to play a little faster than I'm comfortable with for a certain song, or maybe I get a little nervous at a jam session or a gig. 
And then I prioritize those thoughts above staying loose, above my good habits. And because of the fast tempo or the fact that I'm nervous, I might make a mistake. And when I make a mistake, I'll get even more nervous. And then the tension creeps in. And then I'll keep playing with tension until I realize it and then actively release it. Again, it doesn't happen by accident. And it's not always easy to realize that that's what you're doing. And the longer you play with tension, the more normal it feels, hence the bad habit. But what can you actually do about it? How do you adjust? Well, sometimes it's as easy as just letting go of the tension. Again, playing slow, basic roles and just paying attention to how it feels to play. If you can actually just sit there not playing the banjo without tension, then maybe you can try putting your hand in position without tension. And if you can do that, maybe you can play a note without tension. And if at any point in this process you feel tension creeping in, then just stop and reset and try again. And I know this can feel like a painstaking process. And at first it is. But once you do this a few times, you're going to get used to the feeling of playing without tension. And then you're going to know what to expect when you're playing and it doesn't feel like that. When it feels like something else, then you know things aren't right and you need to do some work. And if you find yourself coming back over and over again to release tension, then you're doing it right. That's the process. There isn't anybody out there who's just playing without tension eternally, without having to think about it, without having to do any work. It just doesn't exist. Of course, some people are good at it. And some people like me struggle with it all the time. It's something that I think about all the time. And it's something that I work on all the time. And I'm not perfect with it. In fact, I feel a little tension right now because I've got a bright light shining on me and I'm in front of a camera and I'm just trying to say the right words. So it's not always gonna be the most comfortable situation. But if I can always start from the beginning, if I can reset, if I can just try again, then I've got a shot at building that new habit. Just don't let it get away from you because it's a lot easier to maintain on a regular basis than it is to start over from square one every time it becomes a huge problem. Okay, now we can talk about the last bad habit, which applies to all of these bad habits, and it's called impatience. Right now, you're capable of playing at a certain level without any of these bad habits. And the reality is, it might be just a few notes at a very slow tempo, or maybe it's at a medium tempo, maybe it's even pretty fast. But once you try to exceed that, once you try to play a little faster or a little louder, or with a little more difficulty, sometimes those good habits deteriorate and we use those bad habits to compensate for the added difficulty. And aside from the fact that that doesn't even work, that doesn't even help us play better, it points to a much bigger issue. If in the process of playing something at a certain speed or volume or difficulty level, you can't avoid bad habits, it means you've surpassed your limit for things like speed and volume and difficulty. If I can't play something without tensing up or extending my fingers further than they need to or anything like that, then it really just means I'm not ready to play that yet. And if I keep surpassing those limits with bad habits, then I'm gonna be undoing all the work I did to play with good technique in the first place. So I know I sound like a broken record, but it's possible that the best solution to all of your bad habits when it comes to the right hand or any issue in music really is to play slowly. And on the banjo, that usually means playing basic roll patterns slowly and listening to yourself and paying attention to how it feels. It's a constant process of listening and paying attention and then adjusting based on those results. And by all means, you should be trying to get better. You should seek the boundaries of your ability to try to grow, but you really need to be paying attention to when your technique isn't holding up. I know it doesn't always feel like it, but you are in control of your hands. And that doesn't mean that you can make them do anything right now, but it does mean that you can always choose to take your time, practice thoughtfully and patiently, and ultimately get better. So I hope you found this video helpful, and if you did, please let me know in a comment below, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and like this video. And if you're looking for more banjo content, of course, you can check out patreon.com slash Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.